but more than the main reasons I started being a sound engineer, apart from because I failed all my A-levels, was um, because I wasn't a very good musician. I was born in 1972. My dad worked for ASDA, my mum worked for the government, so both of their jobs took us to different places. From zero to 18, I probably moved maybe 14 times to different cities. So I started off in Middlesbrough, moved around was four to Blackburn, then to three or four places in Wales. I started secondary school in Reading and then moved to Watford. After that, I went to university at Salford in Manchester and I studied uh, professional sound recording and video technology. Uh, it was one of the first sort of audio and video courses that was in this country. The first show I ever did was uh, at Butlins in Skegness, and they wanted to pay £40 a week to go and do that. So it was uh, Celestian speakers, some really old Soundcraft desk, and it was basically just uh, uh, a band playing to a load of kids. It was, um, it was good fun, but too many kids for my liking. I had no idea what I was doing. It was totally new to me. I didn't really know how to use a mixing desk. Um, I was making it up as I went along, but thankfully the people I was working with were very helpful. They were, they were, they were looking after me and making sure I was there. Uh, it was a perfect, perfect place to cock things up. Muck things up, maybe I should have said. <laughs> well, f things up. I did a show looking after Ben, who used to do monetism when the band reformed in 2004. And uh, they did five nights at Brixton Academy, which is fabulous. For me, a guy that, that loves the band from being, being, being a lad and listening to John Peel, etc. And to do shows with the band that were your heroes and you love the music of was always a dream come true. So I looked after Ben for four days, five days, and then the tour was over. And then uh, sadly, Ben decided to stop touring. And uh, as I'd been the last person to look after him, and I knew the front of house guy, Ray Furs, he sort of recommended me to Richard Jones, who's an English manager, and uh, suggested I took over. And that was that. That was at the start of 2005 I started, and I've done it ever since. That three or four year period, I did a, a world tour with Radiohead, a world tour with Björk, and then I started mixing monitors for the Pixies. Everyone socialises with everybody and it is like a family that looks after each other. It's uh, unfortunate because there are a lot of other shows and gigs that aren't, aren't as uh, harmonious as this and uh, been really lucky to be involved in it. The lovely bunch of people that I call my, my friends. And I get paid. The most surprising show, and mainly from a I can't believe I'm doing this point of view, was when I was at Monaco at the Grand Prix. I was doing a Grand Prix ball, and I was just liaising between local production and UK production. James Brown was the turn, and he turned up with no engineer. So I got to mix James Brown after no sound check, after not even seeing an instrument, because they were hidden behind a curtain. So that was the most wow experience than when they came on stage on this rolling stage that rolled forward, that it was, um, it actually went okay. The best prank I think I've done on the road was when Royal Blood were supporting Pixies in America for maybe a month. Every support band that comes with us, we tend to pull a prank on them on the last night. And um, for the last song, the drummer got off his drums and stood on the barrier and sort of wait, clapped his hands in the air like this. And um, we came up with the idea that when he was on the barrier that night, we turned his drum kit 180 degrees so we had to finish the song facing the back of the stage. And it, it, it worked the best, it was the best trick I've ever seen happen because it just, we must have turned this whole drum kit round on the carpet in like five seconds. And we're all off the stage and he looked around and he didn't notice the drum kit was turned until he got to the drum kit and he tried to sit down and he was like, how the heck has that happened? I've used a PM5D for the last 13 years on this, this with this particular band and it's served them steadfastly and there were no issues at all. It was standard at every festival, so I could always get hold of one if we weren't carrying consoles or hiring them locally if it was about to. Solid, sounds great, reverb sound great, everything about it is perfect. It's band. And to move on to the PM7, um, well, this chance to move on to PM7 for these shows, I jumped at the opportunity uh, because we had a rehearsals uh, for three or four days, so we had a, I had a chance to actually fully get around the desk. The three 
words that would describe my Yamaha experience are reliability, fidelity, and aesthetics. And those three things marked with the fact that I could get the desk pretty much anywhere was the reason why I've stuck with it for the last 13, 14 years.